I was like, I feel like I should run up here with a torch or something with that music. It certainly should get us going this morning. Good morning and welcome to Compass. My name is Jen and I serve as the director of Group Life. Happy Sunday, everyone. We're so glad you shoveled your way out and made it here this morning. And a special shout out to those of you who are joining us online today. It's so good to be together and we're glad that you have chosen to worship Jesus with us today. We also want to extend a special welcome to our guests who will be participating in our retreat in daily life. We had a fantastic response and I'm happy to say that the retreat is completely full. And it starts this afternoon and we anticipate a rich, significant week of prayer, community and encounters with Jesus. God is going to do some amazing things and we can't wait to hear all about it. Well, we have some exciting events that are coming up in February that we want to make you aware of. You won't want to miss these, so be sure to mark the dates on your calendar and plan to attend. February the 18th, we're hosting a free family skate at Teen Ranch from 2 to 3 p.m. Well, I can't skate, but I can drink hot chocolate, and I hear that our local Tim Hortons is graciously donating some. So if you're like me, come and enjoy connecting with others around a cup of hot chocolate, and we'll just leave the skating up to those who can do it. Either way, it's a win for everyone. On February the 22nd, we'll begin the journey to Easter by gathering for an evening of prayer. Isaiah 53 tells us that through Jesus' wounds, we can find healing. Together we'll worship and we'll pray with a special focus on healing prayer, knowing that God will meet us here by faith. So please join us for this special time. Well, we believe that community is vital to the health and growth of us as Christ followers. You see, when you connect relationally, you thrive spiritually. And events like these, as well as our midweek programs and our home groups, are a way that you can do just that. And we hope that you are intentionally building relationships with others here at Compass through environments like these. So if you want to take that next step in your faith journey, to build relationships and deepen your walk with God by being a part of an Orangeville area home group, I invite you to attend the event called Group Launch on February the 12th. At Group Launch, we'll help you navigate the process of meeting new people and forming groups in a relaxed, fun, and interactive way. You know, when you try something new, that first step is always the hardest step. So let me encourage you to be brave and take that first simple step by visiting our website and registering for group launch, and then let our team do the rest. If you have any questions about group launch or home groups, you can visit the website, but I'm happy to talk with you after the service, so just come find me. We truly are better together. So with that being said, let's pray together. Would you stand with me as we join our hearts in prayer? Father God, you are the Lord of all creation. And we gather to worship you today. We ask your Holy Spirit to fill this time and this place as we gather in the presence of the risen Christ, would you draw us close, renew our faith, and equip us to share your good news with a world in need. We ask your Holy Spirit to fill this place as well, and as we gather in the presence of Jesus, we ask this all in his mighty, powerful name. Amen. And allow me to give you my welcome as well to Compass this morning, whether you're watching from home or the cottage or even down in Florida. For those of us here in Orangeville, thank you for being here and for braving the weather this morning. Let's worship. I 
Jesus, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free. has ransomed me his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free who is free indeed I'm a child forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for Sets free, oh, is free in me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Sing out who the sun sets free, who the sun sets free, who oh, is free in me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. For me, that has been uh, one of my life songs. Um, like many people, I have struggled with uh, self-esteem, just the, the constant worry and fear of, uh, am I good enough? Am I good enough son? Am I good enough uh, husband and father? Uh, am I good enough piano player sometimes that was on purpose and so that song who you say I am has spoken uh, volumes to me over the course of my lifetime or actually over the course of the time that's been written which has been my lifetime and Psalm 139 has uh, also been one of those passages of scripture that has really um, meant a lot to me if, and if you know if you know my story and if you know who I am and, and my history then then you, then you know and if you don't then I'm going to share a little bit not a whole lot but enough that maybe you'll understand so Psalm 139 says that it reads starting in verse 13 you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. If you know me, I'm quite complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. 
And so for an individual who struggles with questioning a lot about who I am and why things happen and all that wonderful stuff that we go through as humans, I'm being encouraged and I hope that you are being encouraged that we were created for a purpose. A saying that I wear on a sweater often says that you were created on purpose for a purpose. Why am I sharing this? Because somebody needs to hear that. Whether you call yourself a Jesus follower or not, you were created for purpose and on purpose. God loves you, so do we. Let's continue to worship this morning. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory and for your name there's a healing just beyond the clouds Though I walk through fire I see clearly now I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay You make all things work together my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory and for your name when I doubt it Lord remind me I wonderfully made you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay and I know nothing has been wasted no failure or mistake you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay you make all things work together for my future and for my good, you make all things work together for your glory and for your name. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm a canvas and No failure or mistake, you're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay, you're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay, you're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay.
On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was so I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday As a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left His glory above To bear it to dark Calvary So I'll cherish your rugged Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown To the old rugged cross I will ever be true shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown and exchange it someday for a
just for you. And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this world. just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else.
this week, there's a number of us that are going to be participating in a retreat in daily life where we're spending time creating a space and a place to connect with Jesus. And maybe this this idea of doing this is new for you or different. But I wanted to help you to experience that or leave space this morning for you to do that. Oftentimes we think that worship is just to is just about singing and reading words off of screen, but this morning we have a little bit of time this morning to just quiet to leave the worries of yesterday and this morning not just out at the door but at the foot of the cross and so I'm going to stop talking I'm going to allow for space and time for you to just have an inward conversation with Jesus this morning. Father God, in this place and moment of stillness, we whisper with our hearts and our minds words of thankfulness and joy for your many blessings and your new mercies and your grace and your forgiveness. God, we whisper with our hearts and our minds maybe words of pain and sorrow of the fear and the anxiety and the doubt that we may have, but God, we know that you are stronger and greater than all those things. So we give you the things that are troubling us, the things that are worrying us. God, we give you our celebrations and our joys and our happiness. We lay them at the feet of the cross. And we thank that you can take those things. You can lift the burden from our hearts and from our shoulders. You, you can set us free. And God, as we are set free through your Son, may we choose to pursue you, pursue you with all of our hearts and our minds and our soul and our strength.
as we're set free from the burdens that shackle us down, may we choose to shine your light and be a light in our community so that others can pursue you as well. I pray us all in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Together as one, we say, Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Compass. It's great to be gathered across our sites. Good morning in Shelburne. Good morning in Grand Valley. Good morning online. You know, each and every Sunday, we have worship teams that come and they prepare all week. They pray. They use their gifts um, to lead us to the Lord in worship. So across all our sites right now, wherever you're gathered, let's show our appreciation for our amazing worship teams this morning. You know, imagine if you will, if Star Wars ended just as Luke was about to fire his torpedoes into the exhaust port of the Death Star. Okay, the music is building in intensity, the weight of the moment is palpable on Skywalker's face. He lines his shot up in his radar, you're on the edge of your seat, and suddenly the screen goes blank and the credits roll. What gives? Imagine if It's a Wonderful Life ended with George Bailey peering over that bridge, considering his own demise. Right, you followed his incredible story for two hours. He reaches the most crucial moment of his life. Is he going to jump? Is he, is he not? And suddenly the screen goes blank and the credits roll. If Beauty and the Beast ended just as the last rose petal was slowly falling, Beast is dying in the arms of Belle, suddenly the screen goes blank and the credits roll. That's not how stories end. But they don't end with with, with questions. Stories end with resolutions. We love resolutions. It's it's why when I go, dun-dun-dun-dun-dun, yeah, so, <laughs> right? Don't leave me hanging. Finish the thing. You know, we've been journeying for four weeks through an incredible story in the Bible called the book of Jonah. And like we've invested into this guy's story pertaining to his relationship with God. We cringed when he disobeyed God's request for him to go to Nineveh. We pondered his fate as he got thrown overboard into the sea. We are inspired by his prayer in the belly of a great fish. We cheered alongside of him when we we, we witnessed God's kindness and rescue as the fish spat him onto the shore. We move to the edge of our seats as Jonah finally obeys, goes to Nineveh, and prophesies to, to that city about their wickedness. Like, what will they do? What will God do? And we were filled with joy and hope as Nineveh repents. And we were awed by the patience and the kindness of God. 
And so now in the last week of our series, chapter four, the big ending, right? The, resol- the resolution. Surely the Bible is going to put a bow on this thing. Right? Surely Nineveh will go about living right, receiving God's favor. Surely, despite their challenging relationship, Jonah will learn from the lessons of his story. He will go on to have a successful career as a prophet, fully obeying God, and they all lived happily ever after. Surely there will be a resolution. Well, actually, no. The book of Jonah doesn't end with a period or an exclamation mark. It ends with a question mark. In fact, it's one of only two books in the Bible that end with a question rather than a statement, the other being the book of Nahum. The story abruptly ends with God asking Jonah a question, a penetrating and important question that actually never gets answered. The story ends unresolved, and the screen suddenly goes blank, and the credits roll. And we love resolutions. It's true. But, you know, it's often well-asked questions that form the pathways to the best answers. A good question is a powerful thing. It can help us to understand. It can promote creativity. Questions can be the catalyst for change, can be the road to breakthrough. Questions are powerful, and God asks just like the best questions. Throughout the Bible, we see these questions that God asks, and and they're incredible questions. You know, we started our series by saying that the entire book of Jonah, it's not about Jonah, it's not about Nineveh, it's not about the fish, it's It's a book, it's a story that tells us about God. And here in chapter 4, a chapter that ends with a question mark, we find some implicit questions that can really help form and shape our understanding of who God is, what His purposes are for us and in the world. And these questions can help shape us into the kind of people that God is calling us to be. So let's turn to Jonah chapter 4 together on your device or in your Bible. And as we close our series in the book of Jonah, we're going to take a walk through this final chapter. And we're going to consider some questions that God poses to Jonah and to us, questions that can help us understand what is God like, what's his heart? How do we discover more of God's heart and how he's calling us to live? So let's, let's do this together. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 simply starts like this. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Okay, verse 1 kind of has this, this thought that ties into chapter, thro- uh, chapter 3. What seems so wrong to Jonah? Well, the fact that Nineveh was still standing, (laughs) that it was still on the map. The the Hebrew word for angry here is is literally to be hot, to blaze, to burn. Jonah wasn't just displeased at this moment. He was seething with anger. Picture like a cartoon character, you know, when they're really mad and the fire comes out of their ears. (laughs) Like, why so hot, Jonah? You just helped facilitate the largest revival in biblical history. You should be celebrating. But instead, Jonah is burning with anger because God relented from destroying Nineveh at the end of chapter 3. You see, ultimately, Jonah is angry because God forgave and blessed people that Jonah didn't think deserved it. And the first implicit question that we're faced to consider, we already have in verse 1, God asks us, don't you know that I'm a perfect judge? Don't you know that I'm a perfect judge? You know, if Jonah is reminding you of someone else in the Bible right now, you're like, this sounds familiar. It might be the older brother in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. 
right? His foolish little brother, he leaves home, he squanders all his inheritance on every pleasure of the flesh, dishonoring his family, his father, himself for that matter, like sleeping with pigs, rock bottom. And so he returns home, he decides to come home, and do you remember his older brother's reaction? Okay, the older brother has Jonah like all over him, verses 25 and 28 say this, it says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Well, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. And so his his father went out and pleaded with him. And in Jonah chapter 4, God is pleading with Jonah. Just like the older brother in the parable, Jonah had an unbalanced understanding of God's justice and the undeserved forgiveness of a heavenly father. Jonah's wrestle is actually a theological one. Like, it's not right that evil should go unpunished like this. What about your justice, God? See, Jonah believed he was actually a better judge than God. You know, Romans 12 gives us this really incredible list of attributes of spiritual maturity. Okay, it paints this picture of what it looks like when a person is becoming more and more like Jesus. And verse 15 tells us this. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. To join the party in heaven, to rejoice, to dance, to celebrate when an entire city repents of its wicked ways and turns to God, that's time to throw a party, not a tantrum. But Jonah forgot that God is God and he is the judge of every action and attitude, not us. Verse 19 of that same passage in Romans, Paul writes, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, Vengeance is the Lord, is the Lord. See, it's the Lord who reserves the sphere to avenge. That's His. He alone balances the scales of justice. And the story of Jonah is this reminder of our job and our call as God's people to take love to the city of Nineveh, to take the good news of the gospel to the Ninevehs in our lives, to people and places that seem really far from God and people who are really different than us when it comes to faith and allow God to be the judge. He's a loving father, fully invested in the lives of his children who he loves to freely forgive when they turn back to him. He's a righteous judge. He will sort out justice. Our responsibility is to bring love, not judgment. And verse 1 poses the question, don't you know that I'm a perfect judge? Verse 2, Jonah begins praying. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. This is why I ran in the first place, God. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In verse 2, Jonah is like throwing it back in God's face. I told you so. I knew this would happen. Just like I said from the beginning, you're gracious and you're compassionate and you're patient and your love knows no bounds and you hold back from giving people what they deserve and I don't know how I feel about that. Jonah, it's called mercy. And God implicitly asks us in the book of Jonah, don't you know that I am full of mercy? full of mercy. 
you know, the dictionary defines that word mercy like this. Compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it's within one's power to punish or harm. Pastor Tim Keller takes it a level deeper. He says, mercy and forgiveness must be free and unmerited to the wrongdoer. If the wrongdoer has to do something to merit it, then it isn't mercy. But mercy always comes at a cost to the one granting mercy. But it hurts to let that person off the hook. It hurts my pride. It costs me my sense of right and wrong. It, it, it's costing me my, my reputation. It has to cost. That's why it's mercy. And how quickly Jonah forgot the mercy in his own life that God had showed him. The mercy God showed him when he chose to go his own way and disobey God. How quickly he forgot about boarding that ship heading to Tarshish. As he looked at the city of Nineveh, how quickly he forgot his prayer in the belly of a whale. How quickly he forgot his own deliverance as he watched Nineveh's deliverance. How quickly he forgot that God is a God of mercy. What a beautiful word. A God who holds within his power the ability and the right to send calamity and to punish when we blow it, but instead he chooses mercy. And then he tells us to go and do the same. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. It costs at first, but mercy comes with its own reward. And you want God's reward. And God reminds us that he's a God who doesn't give us what we deserve, but he extends mercy and then asks us to do the same thing. Let's keep going. Verses 3 and 4. Jonah's not in a good place, just so you know. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord replied, is it, is it right for you to be angry? Man, I just think those, those verses so poignantly ask the question, don't you know that I'm a patient teacher? See, Jonah isn't just angry, he's despondent. So great is this injustice in his own understanding that he would sooner die than live in a world where this kind of undeserved mercy exists. Kill me now, God. And notice that he actually asked the Lord to take away his life. Lord, kill me now. And, you know, based on his behavior in the first three chapters, if I'm God, I might consider that request. <laughs> We're halfway through the last chapter of the book, and this guy still is not getting it. Like, if I'm Jonah's teacher, man, it's a big red F on his report card. End of semester. <laughs> but the Lord doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't punish him or kill him. <laughs> Rather, God takes this opportunity to ask Jonah a question in an attempt to teach Jonah and to reveal the darkness in his own heart. And, you know, there, there's so many lessons I know in my life, maybe you could say the same thing, that God has tried to teach me, and it's literally, like, taken me years to get it. And there's many more lessons still in, in, pro, in process. Man, I'm so grateful God doesn't give up on us. I'm so grateful that He's a patient teacher. See, we don't so much fail the tests that God, give us, that God gives us, we get to just keep retaking them. He's a patient teacher. 
And God is patient in his work of retraining and reordering our hearts to gain his perspective. Okay, I want you to see things the way I see them. And I will patiently take the time to teach you over and over to love the things that God loves. And Jonah didn't learn the lesson when God asked him to go to Nineveh. He didn't learn the lesson when God sent a great storm. Like he didn't even fully learn the lesson in the belly of a fish. Can you imagine? And through the salvation of being spit onto shore. In chapter 4, we're almost in the book, he's still learning. And here's the beautiful thing. God's still teaching. Don't forget what a patient teacher I am. What are the lessons right now today that you know like God's trying to teach you in your heart that you might gain his perspective? He won't give up on you. Keep moving forward. Verses 5 and 6. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. I love that. Jonah was very happy about the plant. And God reminds us in these verses, don't you know that I'm a kind provider? See, Jonah is still waiting to see some fireworks. Like would his prayer, would his pity party change God's mind? Will the Ninevites quickly return to their old ways? Probably. Will God actually do the right thing and like remove Nineveh from the map? Hopefully. Hopefully. And so Jonah goes and takes this seat on this hillside. He has some big questions, purchased himself in like a good place to take it all in. And the text says that Jonah is very happy. Right? Some translations say exceedingly happy. Why? Two verses ago, he wanted God to kill him. Now he's exceedingly happy. Well, he's happy because God provided a vine to shade him from the scorching sun. Despite his great sin, God's grace was even greater. It is even greater. And here's the point. Never underestimate God's ability to bless us when we don't deserve it. Like, he's that good. Listen, there are times in our lives that life goes well for us because of the wise decisions we make. Absolutely. But there's also times in our lives that things go well for us because we serve a good God. It has nothing to do about us. Right? The Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from God. It's His goodness. It's not based on our goodness. It's based on His character. Our God is a kind provider who provides shade from the scorching heat of life, not because we deserve it, but because He loves us. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides our daily bread. You know, but God was about to use the same blessing, this vine, as an object lesson to ask another penetrating question in verses 7 and 8. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. He wanted to die again, of course. (laughs) And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Two verses back, he's exceedingly happy. (laughs) Now Jonah wants to die again. And God asks, don't you know that I'm the sovereign master? Like, the sovereignty of God is all over this story. God ordered a wind to shake a sea. 
and it obeyed. Then he ordered it to stop, and it stopped. God ordered a fish to swallow a disobedient prophet, and it swallowed. And then he ordered it to spit him up, and it spit him up. Now, here in chapter 4, God orders a vine to grow, and it grows. And then he orders a worm to eat the vine, and behold, a withered stem. Jonah's life was spinning out of control, but there isn't a second in this story that God isn't in complete control. And you know, our our world feels like it's spinning out of control right now in many ways, yeah? Maybe your life feels like it's spinning out of control this moment, like the what-ifs are staggeringly heavy. But the Bible teaches us this is not the case. Ephesians 1.11 says, In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Would you do me a favor? Would you just say everything with me? Everything. Everything. That includes the growing and the disappearing vines in your life. God is sovereign over it all. See, God's sovereignty is an essential part of who He is. He has supreme authority, endless power. And God, this moment is strategically active. Despite how perplexed we are as we look around the world, heaven is not perplexed. Because the sovereign master is on the throne. And God knows when we need the shade of a vine to protect us from the scorching heat of life, and He provides it. And God knows when He needs to remove that vine, so we, we look to Him to fulfill the place of our needs. He knows. He's sovereign. And in these perplexing days in which we live, personally and in the world, God asks, don't you know that I'm the sovereign master? And so we can have peace securely buckled in the sovereignty of God on this ride of life that seems like it's spinning out of control. Nah, the sovereign master's on the throne. Okay, the unresolved ending of this incredible story as God asks us a final question, and it's a big one. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Still teaching. It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And the screen goes blank. And the credits roll. It's the end of the book. You know, if Jonah had some pretty strong questions about a, a, a plant that showed up one night and was gone the next, how strong do you think God's feelings are about the world? And God ends this book by asking us, don't you know how much I love the world? Like, don't you know? A world that doesn't know it's left from its right. Spiritually lost without him. Don't you know? 
And like, I think we can all relate to Jonah a little bit. We are so easily, we, we fall into the trap of worrying about the vines in our life, the comfort, our preferences, our likes, our dislikes, ourselves. <laughs> but you know, the story of Jonah is really a story of a reluctant missionary and a rescuing God. A story that puts on full display for eternity God's heart for lost people. And his desire for us to have that same heart in our chests. You know, as we look around the world, as we look around our community, as we look around our workplaces, and we see people who think and believe differently than us, do we see them like Jonah? as enemies who threaten our way of life? Or do we see them like God, as people created in His image, deeply loved? Despite their wickedness, deeply in need of rescue, worthy of mercy and love, not judgment and anger. See, all the Old Testament stories point to Jesus. Every biblical hero is pointing to a better hero. And the gospel of Jesus is all over this story, friends. There's a way better Jonah. One who, when asked by God to go to a lost and broken place, did not board a ship heading in the other direction. He boarded a manger, and he obediently came. One who didn't spend three days in the darkness of a whale to learn a lesson, but one who spent three days in a grave to teach death a lesson. One who didn't sit on a hillside shaded by the sun, casting judgment on lost people, but one who sat on a hillside overlooking Jerusalem and wept. Because he wanted to gather lost people. He wanted to gather lost people. One who hung on a cross on a hillside in scorching sun, just like Jonah. But he prayed, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. The story of Jonah ends unresolved with a question mark that points to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ answers every theological riddle. The story ends, Jonah's dumbfounded, grappling with a question from God. Don't you know how much I love the world? And God asks us the same question today. Don't you know how much I love that, that, that Muslim family that lives next door to you? Don't you know how much I love them? Don't you know how much I love that, that teenager trying to discover their identity? Don't you know how much I love that person with different political leanings than you? Don't you know how much I love those kids that you coach every Saturday? Don't you know how much I loved unreached people groups in, in other countries in the world? Don't you know? How much I love Orangeville. Don't you know how much I love Shelburne? Don't you know how much I love Grand Valley? Don't you know? And the story of Jonah ends demanding an answer.
Will you be a part of God's rescue plan in the place he's called you? See, we never really find out Jonah's answer to that question. He doesn't answer it unresolved, but we get to answer the question for ourselves. Will we be like Jonah? Or will we, will we be like the better Jonah, Jesus Christ, by sacrificing, by loving, and by leading people to the saving power of a cross and the hope of an empty tomb? I simply leave you with that question. Don't you know how much I love the world? Would you pray with me? God, we're just so grateful for this journey in your word through the book of Jonah. Thank you that in it we discover that you are a forgiving father, a perfect judge. You are full of mercy. You're a patient teacher. You're a kind provider. And oh God, how you love lost and, and broken people. And how you love this lost and broken planet so much. Father, today we just want to recommit ourselves to loving people like you do, to rightly aligning our, our own comforts if they've become out of alignment into serving others, to taking up the mission of your church, to telling and pointing people through the way we, we live towards your rescue plan for them in Jesus Christ. God, forgive us for our judgments, for our anger, for our selfishness. Forgive us for our apathy. God, I pray that you would light a missional fire in our hearts, a passion to see people come to Jesus in our lives, in our church, in our region, and in this world that you so loved, that you gave your one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God, would you use the story of Jonah in our lives to write stories of salvation. And we pray these things in the name of the one who's not just the better Jonah. His name is above all names. He's the better everything. Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Will you stay with us as we close in worship?
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. That's our prayer this morning that we'll build our lives. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will.
Hey, just want to encourage you this week in the places where you work, your sphere of influence, to shine the light of Jesus, the hope of the gospel, to bring his love and his peace and his reconciling power in the places where you go. Hey, don't rush off today. Go have a coffee. Whether you're going to play in the snow or shovel it, it's still going to be there. Spend some time in community. Although our series is officially over, I encourage you to visit the book of Jonah often. Don't forget to grab talking points on the way out. Continue the journey through the week. Um, as an expression of worship to thanks, don't forget to give financially to Compass uh, today by giving online or visiting one of our giving stations. If we can pray for you today in any way, please know that there'll be people here that would just love to journey in prayer with you. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. We love you, Jesus. Have a great week. Thank you.